Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Karin. I think one of the uh, ways to get back to our time management is to speak less. So I will do that. Um, but <clears throat> as a chair, I'll just make a few introductory uh, comments about the issues which should be um, focused in this session. Um, whatever we have been discussing during the last one and a half day, um, I think that depends pretty much on this, uh, on the outcome of this session or, or the issues we're discussing now. Um, <clears throat> because uh, in, during the uh, MDGs, we have seen that, I mean, in many countries and many in several parts of the world, MDGs have been achieved and the progress on MDGs have been quite remarkable. However, in case of um, some goals, particularly the last goal, MDG 8, which is about the partnership, um, which talks about trade, debt, uh, ODA, and technology, uh, the progress on that particular MDG has been quite um, uh, insignificant and this is the weakest link of the whole MDG um, discourse. And, uh, and in view of the you know, insignificant and very um, insufficient progress of the MDGs, the discussion on implementation of the post-MDG issues that have featured prominently during the you know, discu discussion um, which is going on now. Um, and one has to also remember that the whole um, architecture of financial model during the post uh, MDGs has will be changed, and we'll have to think of uh, other ways, other means of implementation of post MDG issues. Now, when you talk about the this session is about ownership and sustainability ownership for sustainability and instruments for delivery when you talk about ownership one of the um, issues which features prominently is the financial issues of course ownership also means about the um, uh, the incorporation or the o ownership in terms of policy um, adoption by the national governments but uh, it, more importantly, it's about finance, uh, it's, uh, because this is one of the important ways for implementation. And finance can be from various sources. Now, um, we know that there are public finances, uh, public sources of finance, then um, private sources of finance, and also there's, there is market. Um, now, when you talk about the public sources, at the domestic level, domestic resource mobilization through taxation, that's, uh, that's quite important and that has been uh, actually um, coming uh, as an important source. Though we know in uh, developing countries and in least developed countries, the tax GDP ratio is still uh, very low uh, compared to the developed countries. But uh, it has been increased during the, during the period 2000 to 2011. Um, government revenue to, through, the, uh, through this uh, domestic resource mobilization process has been increased by four times, and it has potential to increase uh, at the global level uh, at the um, uh, during the uh, post 20 period. Um, and on the other hand, if you look at the um, position or the uh, situation of overseas development uh, assistance. Its importance related to other sources uh, to compared to the um, taxation or FDI or, uh, or remittances, that has been um, decreasing. That has been uh, quite insignificant compared to these uh, other modes of finances. And um, as we know, I mean, it's no point of repeating this thing that the commitments of 0.7% um, of the GNIs um, of, the, of the donor countries, that has never been met, um, except for you know, one or two countries. And there's, a, there's still a huge gap. And if you look at the uh, various sources of finance, I mean, the uh, contribution of ODA is about, in 2012, um, it's about 126. And if you include the uh, sources from other uh, countries, uh, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, um, and China, and other Asian countries, uh, that adds to about another $1 billion. Um, but uh, but, uh, but, the, but still, it's uh, in terms of 
uh, volume or in terms of growth it has been since it has been declining since 2010 there is a, a decline and uh, in from 2000 to 2012 there is a decline of 6% um, in in case of ODA now um, as opposed to um, ODA i mean there there is also discussion about the south south cooperation as another important source of um, finance and uh, the and that has been discussed in view of the some of the emerging economies like india china brazil um, uh, as important coming to play an important role in the global economic scenario um, and i have mentioned about the other you know other sources also and uh, some view that this is uh, uh, this these sources of finance that south south cooperation is is um, more amenable in the sense that it uh, it has less uh, explicit policy conditionalities and on the other hand it puts uh, more emphasis on the infrastructure and productive sectors as opposed to the um, poverty elevation and uh, all other all uh, other social needs um, emphasized by the uh, traditional ODAs um, but having said that it's also viewed that it, um, south south cooperation cannot be a substitute for ODA because uh, still um, uh, it's growing um, over the years it has been growing and uh, the latest data shows that it has been uh, it has really um, shot up but one of the reasons is that because of because it has been now accounted for all these years it was not accounted for and there was not there were not adequate data on that so the other source of uh, private finance is that is about foreign direct investment and has another, it has it also has potential because foreign direct investment brings about technology and um, uh, uh, skills uh, so this is uh, another source and another very important source for the developing countries uh, for the middle income in countries and and for ldcs also is the remittance and workers remittance it has been increasing it's been actually four times um, almost twice of the uh, of the oda um, now and it has it is also less uh, less uh, uh, costly because it goes directly to the household and it increases the welfare of the households and we have seen that during the uh, financial crisis the the resilience of remittances have been you know, proved quite um, promising so uh, and in the near future um, if there is skill development and market diversification, there is huge potential for increasing the remittances. Um, then um, also other sources, for example, philanthropy uh, and private uh, development assistance um, uh, there, and it's also increasing at a faster rate, but their focus is on, the, on more of water, sanitation, health, humanitarian um, uh, uh, ground. Um, but um, still, uh, it's not enough. I mean, adequate to the uh, to the needs of uh, what the world needs right now. Uh, other sources, uh, other so sources of funds is also um, in case of uh, we see that various kinds of uh, innovative development fi uh, funds that they are IDF, and um, um, it, for example, you know, um, climate funds then. Um, airline Taxes. These are various forms of uh, you know, carbon taxes. These are uh, coming uh, in a in a major way, and there are also various innovations in terms of looking for um, you know, finances. But uh, <coughs> there are uh, the thing is uh, now we'll have to in view of the uh, in view of the relative uh, less importance of ODA. So one has to look for diversification of sources of finance. And also uh, effectiveness, because um, f without, you know, we have uh, been discussing about the effectiveness of uh, aid a lot. And uh, in order to improve the effectiveness of all s sources of finances, I mean, the institutional mechanism uh, has also need to be uh, changed. For example, you take the case of domestic resource mobilization. Um, it's a challenge for developing countries, particularly because of their weak revenue administration system and also low taxpayers' morale, and also heavy reliance of uh, multina multinational enterprises. Uh, we see that corporate taxes in many uh, least developed countries is quite high. And also difficulties in terms of you know, um, uh, dealing with the state-owned enterprises, which are, uh, which are usually the lowest uh, taxpayers. So 
these, these are the domestic challenges, but at the global level, increasing the effectiveness of aid, um, if you look at the um, targets which have been set by the Paris Declaration, most of the targets have not been fulfilled. And in case of other innovative fun funds and uh, funds for climate change issu issues, for example, Global Environment Facility, then Adaptation Fund, Climate Investment Fund, Green Climate Fund, all these funds are there. But um, as opposed to the you know, diversification of these types of uh, funds, there are many, many funds which are coming, uh, proliferating in the scenario, but most of these funds remain underfunded. So this is another challenge that, uh, so uh, it's most of the cases it's more of a rhetoric uh, rather, than, um, re uh, rather than bringing the real um, issues in, on the ground. So identification of you know, suitable funds also are also a challenge for those countries. There are funds, but accessing those, those funds are difficult for countries because of the various uh, you know, stringent formalities, elab elaborate formalities, complexities in the, in the application process and all this. Um, last but not the least, I would uh, mention about the trade issues, because when you talk about uh, partnership and one of the important issues of, of the MDG-8, was this subsector was trade, but we have seen that uh, unfortunately there has been very little progress in terms of um, uh, Doha development um, round because um, in MDG MDG 8 talks about a rule based non discriminatory trading system, but after 12 years of uh, no, Doha round, the 12 years of the launch of the Doha round negotiations, we don't see any progress. Uh, so. Uh, the discussion about reforming the WTO system itself has come into the fore. Um, uh, and another issue is that, you know, rather than depending on only public and private sources, um, there's also discussion about, you know, the market mechanism. You, you um, bring or you generate mobilized resources from, uh, from the market through equity bonds and forex uh, um, uh, mar markets. So, uh, but that also a, a challenge for uh, countries which have very little, you know, resources themselves. The g size of the GDP is so uh, so low that they cannot really participate in various global uh, markets and uh, bonds. Um, so. Uh, in view of all these, you know, uh, proliferation of various types of finances and mechanisms, now one has to look for uh, uh, look for the effectiveness of these uh, of these finances, financial mechanism, and also um, how to how to incorporate um, in the agenda for post 2015 to make it more effective um, in view of the unsuccessful. Um, progress in, uh, during, the po uh, during the MDGs. Um, with these opening remarks, I would now um, call upon the presenters. Uh, we have four presenters in the session. And uh, first, I would uh, request Ms. Pooja Prabhati. She is the director of Wadana Todo Abhiyan, um, a uh, civil society organization, I understand. Um, she will be talking on implementing a just and inclusive development agenda. Um, uh, Pooja, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Famida, and thanks for the uh, really comprehensive overview on the financing uh, situation. And just a clarification, Vadana Todo Abhiyan, I'll also talk a little bit more about it. It's a campaign, so I'm just leading the work on the post-2015 agenda. So um, this, I'll take this opportunity to share with you the campaign action strategies as an illustration of how one of the uh, you know, uh, civil society networks campaigns have kind of engaged in this process of you know, influencing and shaping the post-2015 development agenda and uh, look at some specific uh, concrete recommendations pertaining to the overall framework question, which is within the framework of just governance. So uh, I wouldn't be dwelling too much on the financing question, and I'm uh, sure we can have a discussion on that later if need be. But I would want to share a little bit more about the campaign's actions and how we have kind of approached the process of influencing and shaping 
some consensus around what should the new development agenda look like from the context of uh, developing country and more particularly from India. So um, to take you through, okay, no, no problem. So uh, just before getting into that, I'll just very briefly tell you about Vadana Todo Abhiyan. Vadana Todo Abhiyan translates to Don't Break Your Promise campaign. So this kind of evolved uh, right after the World Social Forum in 2004, which was uh, organized in Mumbai. And it was felt that there needs to be some kind of an independent civil society platform that would uh, that would kind of you know provide a space for civil society to up to uh, your PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Yeah. Do you want me to take that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So primarily the work of Vadana Todo Abhiyan has been to kind of scrutinize and hold the government accountable on its promise to end poverty, to end discrimination, social exclusion, etc. Um, but it has been pretty recently uh, also begun to kind of focus on the question of looking at what would the framework be post MDGs, post 2015. Now to uh, tell you a little bit more, in uh, early 2010, it was around that time that Vadana Todo Abhiyan undertook this exercise of doing a sort of comparison across states. Uh, we are a federation, I mean, we are like a, several states are there, so we did a comparison of around 20 states, looked at the status of MDG's achievement across these states, and that was the starting point for WNTA to kind of get involved in this process. And it was felt that given the kind of uh, 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 breadth and scope that the network has, uh, it's a campaign that kind of uh, comprises of around 4,000 odd civil society organizations, grassroots movements, other campaigns that are all involved, just to give you some examples, the Right to Food campaign in India, uh, INGOs like Oxfam, uh, UNICEF, Save the Children, etc., and many other civil society independent organizations and really grassroots uh, groups, etc., are also part of the campaign. So to begin with, I mean, uh, before 2012, I mean, in the year 2012, there was a pre, uh, you know, preliminary process of kind of collecting and mapping what is the understanding on what comprises of MDGs, and does the community even understand what does this whole thing uh, you know, imply to them? Because what was found was that people don't really understand what MDGs are in a you know, village or in a gram panchayat. So one would need to kind of talk to them first and say that, listen, this is not really very different from the kind of schemes and programs that you are having to encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is just another framework within which you're looking at your development. So that mapping process took place in 2012, and we conducted several across the country and uh, it kind of came culminated into a national consultation in November it was followed uh, right after with a southern dialogue where we got several civil society actors from across the region from South Asia and from uh, Latin America etc who had a initial preliminary discussion in terms of how to have you know what kind of strategies could be kind of explore to take this forward. And then there were several documents and literacy materials that were um, uh, taken up. Yes, sure. So uh, in terms of the strategies, uh, we've identified six key strategies. We also wanted to look at, uh, you know, engaging with the corporate sector, but unfortunately we haven't had, we haven't made much headway on that, so I haven't put that here. So the first uh, remains to kind of develop community, uh, you know, look at capturing community expectations, which we have try to do through community hearings across the country, about 100 community consultations. 50 of them have uh, been concluded and 50 are ongoing. And then this has been substantiated with popular education material, flyers, posters, etc., that have been uh, disseminated. And then another important critical aspect, of course, is to ensure that there is some consensus on the kind of alternative goals or frameworks that we would want to uh, identify and recommend. 
for that, uh, civil society consensus was uh, more or less kind of uh, gathered and a document was uh, prepared and presented to the author of the high-level panel report, which had our set of recommendations in terms of uh, specific themes and broader principles. Another key area that we felt has always uh, been left out, at least from the civil society perspective, is to kind of look at the engagement with the research and academic community. And there again, we've tried to kind of develop think pieces in collaboration with a reputed uh, Indian uh, research organization to look at, and uh, we would also be doing a collaborative research in terms of looking at specific questions. Of course, any of this would not make sense if we are not engaging with the policymakers. And for that, we see ourselves doing uh, active, uh, I mean, engaging actively and advocating with the legislators, the parliamentarians, political parties, now with the general elections almost uh, upon us. So this also provides a very unique platform for us to talk to them. And then there was this uh, UN process relating to the My World campaign, which also was something that we collaborated with them. Uh, we also recognize that although there are several movements and uh, civil society initiatives, but they somehow remain restricted to the national level and do not really go up to the uh, uh, you know, regional level or at the global processes, feed into the global processes. So with that in mind, it was also felt that it's important to engage more globally, so call to action against poverty beyond 2015 and many other such networks. We collaborate with them and we also kind of uh, did several, uh, uh, initiated several processes and advocated for what the recommendations that we felt would be critical perspective. And then, of course, media campaign was uh, a critical part of that in which we uh, have tried to kind of look at uh, social media to begin with, uh, to you know disseminate understanding on this with the, among the youth. And there has been a lot of uh, interest uh, generated. If you click on the link, you can go to the uh, portal Youth Ki Awaz. And these are just some snapshots of uh, some global advocacy opportunities that we kind of tapped into and also uh, were part of. We were invited to speak at the UN uh, special event on MDGs, and uh, that was also something which kind of afforded us an opportunity to talk about what are the specific uh, recommendations from a very developing country, uh, Global South context. Uh, so just to very briefly tell you that, I mean, um, apart from the specific thematic recommendations, which uh, are about 50 uh, recommendations that we have. We also feel that there are five principles that need to foreground any of the new development framework that would be uh, coming into place. And we have had a lot of discussion in the last uh, uh, yesterday and today. So I'll just kind of mention these and we can come back to them later on. So human rights, social inclusion, which is really critical from our country context, like yesterday, Dr. Sabarwal also mentioned about uh, Dalits, Adivasis, etc. And we have minorities, we have other, uh, uh, you know, intersectionalities in terms of discrimination that needs to be addressed. Gender justice, environmental justice, and uh, really important from our perspective is just governance. And this is uh, quite heartening for us that this is not just something that we are talking about. All the reports of the UN, the high-level panel report, the UNSG's report, and the UN NGLS report, all of them kind of see to the whole issue of you know looking at governance from a very human rights uh, inclusive framework. So uh, we have tried to kind of articulate this in the form of an alternative goal. And uh, we kind of, uh, this is just a very draft uh, formulation. And this is, again, something that we have uh, come up based on a lot a uh, huge iterative process that uh, took place. So we're saying that we would want universal, accessible, and just governance processes and mechanisms that ensures that the bottom decile are participants in decision-making processes and oversight. So although all the three reports that I mentioned do talk about governance as principles, but they may leave out certain things such as devolution of powers to the uh, you know, local levels, decentralized decision making, and uh, ensuring that there is more uh, inclusion at the grassroots level, et cetera. So, uh, and then there are specific indicators that we have fleshed out, and all of this is available on our website, and I can also talk a little bit more about it later. So some of the key principles relate to transparent 
governance systems that are there so that that can allow for participation of people, accountable mechanisms that are there, accountability mechanisms in terms of ensuring that there is a oversight, not just the civil society oversight, but also formal mechanisms of oversight, inclusive uh, governance uh, processes wherein the most disadvantaged, the most uh, uh, excluded people are also consulted in the process of deciding what are their priorities and a responsive institutional apparatus relating to you know specific uh, uh, mod uh, processes such as gender responsive budgeting S uh, schedule cast schedule drive budgeting etc these kind of uh, uh, methods could be adopted to ensure that the uh, governance systems and structures are more responsive and of course all of this needs to be foregrounded in a human rights frame and we are referring particularly to not just the Millennium Declaration, but also to the UDHR, particularly like Articles 6, 8, 19, 21, which particularly speak about the need to kind of foreground human rights perspective. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Pooja, um, for your uh, very uh, enlightened presentation. We, um, we learned a lot about your organization and how it is working towards uh, an inclusive and just um, society. Now I would um, call upon Dr. Abhinash Kumar for making his presentation. He is the area chairperson in public policy and governance. And Dr. Kumar will uh, present um, uh, his, uh, his uh, work on partnership for sustainable development goals in South Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Uh, I like to use maximum time for my presentation, but before I start my presentation, let me put forth three uh, assumptions which we have uh, after going through the literature review. When I say literature review, I was discussing during the lunch time with the day. Uh, I actually had th 239 articles, not article exactly, but articles and reports. And uh, what I understand now that in the domain, the policy domain, when we are talking about ownership, uh, when we ha need a regulation to have ownership to take care of your parents, uh, thinking about ownership from business community without regulation is not possible. This is one stand I take. The second stand which I take is uh, South Asia needs speed, it needs scale, and it needs a space where we need to have a replicable model and fast model. And I feel that there is no either or situation. I know I'll get into controversy. I don't think there is an either or situation between market or no market. There is a need to have market in a much more partnership model where it can work. The third thing which I want to stress upon is that mainstreaming uh, as per academic discourse as, as per me does not mean like pure economist I may differ where we talk about the access to the market with poor. What we also mean as a social scientist and a sociologist and anthropologist that in the form of which the poor participates in market as well as the degree of access the poor has to the market. Now, just to summarize my understanding from the academic literature, I want to put forth through this three noble monkeys. What I feel is that, what is the learning from these three noble monkeys? One, that ears, eyes, and mouth are not in tandem. This is the first learning which I have. The which I have is that when all of these occupy their hand for function which is not expected to, then it is much more expected that there won't be policies which will drive something which is leading towards sustainability. The last one is that they still remain in silos. And I'm talking about these three E's with striking inequality, increasing environmental degradation, and knitting market and marginalized. I'm taking one case of policy initiative of India where luckily I was also part of it, where how this model is expected to, because it's very new, it has just got enacted in May 2013, uh, though it was earlier initiated by uh, the government of India in 2011. So how this can build this, this will be my argument for another 10 minutes. Before I started writing this paper, I tried to dovetail my research questions, though I have three research questions, but with the time limit, I like to focus on the second one, which is about why do private sector alliance a partnership in MDGs remain limited to corporate philanthropy. And it was said by strategic philanthropy, which is used by business community, becoming from a business school, I do understand why they use this term. But uh, 
on the first question, just to bring you one note, because uh, when we moved from Brutland to MDG, my understanding is that if you go through Brutland very carefully, at least 10 times, if I correct remember, it talks about reviving growth and changing the quality of growth. In MDG, we forgot this particular nomenclature or to bring this principle into the discourse. That is something which I think needs to be brought in. When I dovetail the international policy thing, which I have listed here, I don't want to read them, and also dovetail with some of the focus group discussion, what I did was I have an opportunity of interaction with the Indian policy makers because they come for one year on public policy speaking. So I conducted focus group discussion with them as well as among the challenges of Delhi and tried to. I, I actually gathered one basically discussion from the 13 year old child which reflected and there is a synergy, there is a confluence between what the international policy making is thinking about and what is that child thinking about the future generation. This is written here, I don't want to read but it actually captures to most of these policy dialogues which are happening all across the South Asia or which we see in the academia and international community. Now we have been discussing about South Asia though the HDI, this is the average of 20 years, so though maybe we, we will contradict with the current HDI but this is the average and there is a variation. I have taken Iran also as part of the South Asia because the HDI do include Iran as part of South Asia. But do this variation really leads to scope of partnership? Uh, personally, with a lot of understanding on South Asian context, what I understand is that there is a trend towards accumulation of decentralized power in South Asia, which is common to all South Asian countries. The second thing is there is an assimilation of globalized market, which is trying to erode the power of the center in decision making, and I do believe the political decision making is moving towards the economic decision making processes. That is how one is moving towards. Though it is also a phenomenon not only in South Asia, it's all over if you read people who write on power. Now power no more rests in center, they rest in the periphery. That is one characteristic of South Asia which is very common. The, l the second thing which I feel is common in South Asia is the scarcity of resources and social and spatial exclusion, they overlap. Probably to best of my knowledge, except China, there is nowhere in the world where they don't overlap. The resource rich area is the poorest area and excluded area. And South Asia reflects a very drastic, a good example. If you see Pakistan, the HDI of Baluchistan is the worst HDI which you can, can see with all these indicators. Similarly, if you see in India, similarly you see in Sri Lanka, Nepal, every place is in, you can see there, there is a kind of overlap between the social and spatial exclusion. The worst thing which is happening in South Asia is, here is the region where there is an institutionalization of violence as well. So there is a kind of, five minutes? Okay. Let me go to the context then. Uh, mm. So, Partnership has been talked about by many people and I'm taking the HDR last two because I don't have time. I want to speak on the policies initiative as well. Uh, the last one which is there on the rules and institution that build not trust I will talk about because trust is a very philosophical term but cohesion and how this can be seen. Uh, I in my paper tried to see that there are two models of business and partnership. When we talk about three E's, that is the or that is basically the economy, the environment, and equity, uh, which is distorted on the model one. And if we want to achieve, this is the desire of most of the countries to achieve to the model two. Uh, I believe that there is a uh, scope that if you improve the government decision-making processes, regulate the business to focus sustainable practices in the spatially excluded areas. And the last one is that if you link it with sustainability and incentives, I'm not talking about incentives in very myopic terms of the financial incentives, but incentives are many actually. Even if you reduce the cost of doing business is an incentive for the business. If you can reduce that administrative cost or transaction cost, business will be eager to get into this model. What I want to also highlight with that footer which you see is a hot spot. There is always a tendency by private sector because private sector will only come for profit it's not possible that private sector will come for any kind of philanthropy or development. They will go for hotspots. Are the hotspots are generally by defined by the resource-rich area, labor is cheap, and transport facilities, infrastructure. 
there it is also talked on in in theory if you see in academics it's a pollution heaven theory it's a another one where the state tries to influence fdi and leverage through certain kinds of rules and regulations tapered towards the benefit of the corporate so what happened in the context of india in 2011 there was an understanding with the csr and sd that how to integrate this policy and practice commitment between these three and the notion of responsibility to convert into accountability with independent evaluation this was this cannot be understood though there are many speakers from india but let me just share with you i've tried to summarize that how the paradigms of policy making in india has moved from 80s to the current dimension if you see 80s the most of the policies in india was about cleaning on pollutions and targeting poor as a welfare which was more like a subject to be delivered the second phase was 90 to 2000 where there were preventive measures which were taken and there were kind of initiatives however the 2000 post 2000 scenario is very different it's all about rights i mean there there was a discussion in the earlier discussion by the uh, on the indigenous population and the rights and the kind of policies which are being addressed to it what has happened, not only one right, like I'll tell you, citizen charter is one that you have to deliver within the limited time frame. All the, there are 15 public services identified by the state. There is, a, there is a SDF framework, that is the every ministry has to have a framework on the website, which is for the public access, where goal, achievement, deadlines, targets are there. You have right to information, you have right to employment, right to food, right to education, now right to universal health is coming. So the whole paradigm is moving towards right. And let me just come to this policy initiative. India is the first country to introduce CSR as a kind of accountability and right measure. There's no other country which has gone into this. This is what I'll just give you in the bit. In 2013, this is called now uh, the Sustainability Corporate Social Responsibility and Sustainability Guideline. It's an act now. It has a commitment of the board because most of the CSR, if you understand the business sector, uh, the, the CSR was handled by the HR, human resource. This says no more HR doing, the head of the co company has to cater to the accountability of the projects. Two projects, they mandate every corporate to implement. One is on environment and one is on inclusive development. They have identified the areas, the backward areas. The backward districts which are identified are 272 approximately in 27 states. So if you are implementing, you have to go back to the partially excluded area. You say one minute, I'll just come to that. This, there are models which are evolved how much money they should invest in. Uh, one to two percent, of course, with the five billion basically enterprise. Two to three percent with one to five million and then similarly. There is a mandatory disclosure, which was one of the most conspicuous aspects of CSR. And they also say that you cannot have your own evaluation. You have to have independent evaluation. And what they say is that if you don't invest this much money for two consecutive years, there is a fund called sustainability fund which is created. That money will go to the sustainability fund and government will use for sustainability. I just want to come to this conceptual framework. I feel that most of these policies were not implemented with the business sector primarily because we talk about three E's, but the strategy on how, what is to be promoted, what is to be protected, and what is to be preserved is not so clear. If I talk to business community, they are really confused. What do we want? Because there is a guideline which is coming. In fact, Government of India has changed this guideline thrice because of the kind of this. And now, if you see this, what do I mean if you see the strategy of promote for the business uh, as per my research and as per my dialogue and in the, in the policy making process of this particular guideline, what I realized that there is a need to promote economy and equity too. Uh, however, uh, from the business perspective I'm talking about, there is a need to protect environment and equity. There is a kind of dual prong which is being played for all the you see it. When I say promote, and when we, I talk about sustainability, sustainability, what I mean to say is has to be defined and segregated from sustain, attain, and retain. That is the concept to be segregated. Otherwise, we will not see that model. Because ultimately, if I am a CSR professional, I am trained in business and to earn profit. You are talking about philosophical domains, which are not so clear to me. And thereby, this may not happen. So this, we, we call it business 
and personally uh, with my academic understanding on this i believe a green business and sustainable business of course there is a council for sustainable business as well uh, responsible business which came through as a terminology by uh, sidbi in india uh, and this also talks about responsible business is a architect they say that you have to lay down an architect and whereby who is accountable for csr they also say that the sustainability project will only be evaluated not on ground but also on the knowledge across the domain so they are saying not only institutionalization as a vertical but as a horizontal phenomena in the companies they are talking about two process of evaluation one is the external Dr. that Kumar, you have to have two process yeah, just, just one minute, that's a clue external and internal is the internal processes how you reduce the negative consequences on the sustainability and since i don't have time uh, though what i thought in south asia there is a need what was talked about chairperson also uh, domestic resource mobilization but i think we have to be very specific in south asia don't lack about only resources i tell you the example of india india's 47% of the economy runs into a black economy resources are enough what we need a dedicated money and that is what i want to term as as domestic development assistance so that the assistance financial assistance are brought into this the last thing which i want to conclude is since it is being talked about what's the way forward what's the kind of indicator and target which we are trying to foresee there should be there could be because there are several international documents which are talking about maybe it may not come as a goal it may come as a target but i think promoting business uh, as a responsible may be one of the targets or goal and i think it can be as a target or indicator which is increasing percentage of private sector investment in environment and inclusive growth or socially or spatially excluded areas at the same time reducing unjust consumption that is the unethical consumptions of resources by the responsible business thank you so much for thank you so thank you dr kumar um, yes uh, you have uh, very aptly discussed various dimensions of um, Uh, you know the, you have brought into the issue of brand land commissions and then mdgs how mdgs could not um, actually incorporate the basic uh, principles the fundamentals of the brand land uh, report and then um, you also analyzed you said that you have um, done a research of various papers but um, i was expecting that how your you know um, literature review could be linked to the findings whether they are i couldn't uh, maybe you can discuss um <clears throat> but you talked about the business uh, responsible business and uh, in the way forward you really brought up uh, some very important suggestions thank you so much for that we would now move on to the third paper of this session um this paper is titled why south asia needs to have climate change in the post 2015 development agenda Uh, Mr Andrew Scott who is a research fellow at the Overseas Development Institute in London um Mr Scott over to you Excuse me thank you thank you very much chair um let let me start by uh saying thank you to SEPA for the opportunity to participate in this symposium ODI has worked with SEPA on a number of occasions uh, and uh it's a pleasure to do so on the the topic of today's discussion Um as you know ODI has been engaged in the post 2015 debate for uh, a number of months now um probably going back into the beginning of 2011 um and we're doing that through our own work uh through partnerships with other organizations in including for instance the My World initiative that that Pooja mentioned to in, in partnership with UNDP Uh, and also through uh, a network of think tanks called the Independent Research Forum uh, for Post 2015 agenda, which, which is uh, starting to host some informal retreats for members of the Open Working Group. All of that engagement tends to be in in Europe and New York, however, uh, and so it, it's a, a real privilege to uh, come here and, and hear perspectives from South Asia. My my paper is on the the argument for ensuring that climate change is included in the post 2015 development agenda um using some some South Asian references and and evidence. Um but I'm going to use the few minutes I've got here to elaborate uh more on the the implementation of uh what climate change means in the post 2015 agenda 
ra rather than focus directly on the paper itself. I'll be very happy to receive any comments um, uh, later or, or afterwards on, on the paper once you've had a chance to absorb it. First, though, let me, let me start by asking the question, why climate change? Um, I think in, in this forum, uh, it, it, it's self-evident, perhaps, that climate change would be part of the post-2015 development agenda. Um, we've been talking about environmental sustainability, and climate change is clearly part of that. Um, but actually, it's not so obvious. Um, the high-level panel concluded that climate change is hugely important for the development process, describing it as, as the biggest threat to, to development. And we've already heard from others about how climate change um, is potentially uh, going to reverse development processes, uh, and it's certainly going to make uh, achieving poverty eradication more costly. But it hasn't always been obvious, even to the high-level panel, that climate change needed to be in the agenda. Um, those of us who managed to see one of the early drafts of the high-level panel report noted that in there, they almost deliberately avoided committing to saying anything about climate change because of the politics involved in the relationship with the UNFCCC and the risk that the uh, bogged-down negotiations uh, under the UNFCCC uh, would potentially uh, hinder agreement on a post-2015 agenda. So that there are some very strong uh, arguments being put forward for, for why climate change uh, is, should, uh, uh, it, its appearance in the post-2015 framework um, needs to be considered carefully. The Open Working Group doesn't discuss this until January, um, so it's still not clear how climate change will feature in, in the, the framework. Um, I think personally it's, it's self-evident that, that it needs to be there. In fact, I think it's almost inconceivable that climate change in some way will not be part of the post-2015 framework. The real question is, is how it's going to appear in there. Is it going to be at the order of a goal? Is it going to be at the order of targets and indicators? And it raises the, the, another critical question, which is what will the relationship be between climate change in the post-2015 agenda and climate change efforts under the UNFCCC? That, that is actually analogous to some of the discussion we were having yesterday on, on human rights, where we've got uh, agreed international conventions covering certain areas that we, we want to see enforced. Um, and we have to be uh, aware that the UNF, the post-2015 development agenda is, is going to have to recognize and take account of, of these commitments in some way. The, the challenge of climate change is particularly relevant to, to the topic of, of this session, not least because climate change is uh, going to affect all of us. And we all individually and collectively have a responsibility to do something about it. Climate change is also, also relevant um, because it, it's a global problem. Addressing climate change requires global collective action. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to uh, reduce emissions and achieve uh, a stable climate. So the responsibility is on all countries. And that's been recognized under the, the Durban platform agreed uh, under the UNFCCC two or three years ago, uh, where all countries recognize a responsibility to address climate change. Uh, that itself is, is uh, akin to, the, if you like, the, princ the principle of universality that we hear being talked about uh, and it will be embedded in the post-2015 agenda, that the objectives apply to all countries and all countries have a responsibility to address them. We also can note that climate change presents a, a potential model for how to address other global public goods. Um, we had some talk about the global commons yesterday. These are, these are issues that require global collective action. 
And the formulation of the post-2015 development agenda is going to have to consider whether and how to include issues like the global column, co commons. Um, this, this morning's discussion on IPRs, for instance, is, is, is the area of IPRs uh, an area that could be categorized as a global commons uh, or a global public good. The, the trade regime we've heard mentioned several times, the stability of the financial system, global public health issues, the, these are all global public goods types questions which global collective action will be required to address. The post-2015 development agenda is going to have to consider how to include uh, means and objectives to tackle them. But collective or shared responsibility also has to be fair and equitable. And this brings us straight to the thorny question of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, which is a, 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 a Rio principle now embedded in most international environmental agreements and under the UNFCCC has a very specific legal interpretation. CBDR was included by the UN General Assembly as being one of the principles for the post-2015 agenda to pursue uh, and incorporate. Um, but we don't yet know how this is going to be interpreted in the post-2015 framework. There's potential for it to be a blockage. It's a highly contentious area. It's been highly contentious under UNFCCC, and it's potentially highly contentious in the post-2015 negotiations. The reason it's contentious is because it's really about resources. It's, it's an interpretation of the principle of universality and shared responsibility that recognizes another principle of equity and fairness. Um, but when it gets down to the negotiations, what's driving is quite often the question of resources. That discussion tends to be focused on where the, th the resources are going to come from and how much are they going to be. If CBDR is going to be an integral part of the whole post-2015 framework, it also has potential implications for spending priorities, not just the, the, the amount of resources that are going to be available. As the Chair has pointed out, uh, we, we need to start thinking about the whole package of resources and finances that contribute to, sustain, to of development objectives. We're not now just talking about ODA, which is really what differentiation in the Millennium Declaration was about. We're talking about the whole range of both public and private finances that will be used to achieve development objectives. Under, under the, the, the post-2015 framework the, the, and with the Financing for Development expert group, there's a potential to start perhaps redefining what we mean by these resources and, and taking them all into account. The OECD is currently undertaking an exercise to review the whole package of public finance resources that go to development, arguably with a view to redefining what we mean by ODA. I think when it comes to taking views from the South, the South now start, needs to start thinking about what do the, you mean by the kind of financing and financial resources that you expect to see, both particularly in the, in the, from the public sector, and that means both the international public sector and the domestic public sector, and also what implications does that mean for leveraging, as is much of the talk, uh, of using public finance to, to, to lever private finance to achieve ob development objectives. These are hugely thorny issues which we're only beginning to, to get to uh, start discussing under the auspices of uh, the Open Working Group. Um, and I think it, it, it's incumbent on all of us to, to start thinking about uh, not just what the, the framework of goals and targets and indicators is going to be, but also what the, the means of implementation are going to be uh, and thinking about the different options that lie there, both in terms of, of finance uh, and terms of, as we were hearing this morning, access to, to technology, access to knowledge and information, all of which are going to be critically important for all countries to pursue their sustainable development objectives. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much for keeping it to time, actually. Um, yes, uh, Dr.
Mr. Andrew Scott, he has uh, highlighted a number of important issues why climate change should you know, come um, appear as a as a separate or um, standalone goal. How should how should it appear as a target or a goal? Um, and it's important uh, because it's also a global uh, commons, uh, global good, and uh, it's going to ha impact everyone. Um, so he also raised the issue of uh, climate change being one of the most contentious and politicized issue. And that's why uh, very little progress um, towards you know, bringing climate change as an important goal um, that has not, uh, has not appeared as yet. And um, he also um, argued about the uh, various, um, various sources of finance uh, because um, uh, we know that climate finance, I mean, that has been committed, but whether it is um, additional to the traditional ODA, that has been an issue uh, because we know the $100 billion has been committed as clean, uh, as, a, as a climate fund, as part of the climate fund whether that is additional or not, that's an issue. Uh, so he actually uh, given, uh, gave an overview of, uh, of the various aspects of climate change issues. Um, and he also raised whether it should come as a standalone, climate change should come as a, a standalone goal or environmental sustainability should come as a standalone goal. Um, so we'll, we'll be discussing about his uh, presentation paper later on now. I would call upon the final presenter of this session, Professor Hirohisa Kohoma. He is the Professor of Economics at the University of Shizuoka, Japan, and he will be making a presentation on Japan's aid in the post-2015 development agenda. Professor Kohoma, over to you. Thank you. Uh, how to... Okay, it's okay. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a pro-growth economist from Tokyo. <laughs> I'm afraid uh, I'm a minority here. I don't know. Anyway, I have just 10 minutes for presentation. So uh, I will make, I'll show you, present my uh, conclusive statement. Uh, my economics is based on uh, Japan's development experiences. Uh, but there exist uh, many misunderstandings on Japan's high growth in post war period. But anyway, I understand competition-based policy management is a key to understand the high growth in the 1960s. But in this process, growth and equity philosophy is very important. Uh, Ministry of Finance of Japanese government uh, announced the very explicitly on the we pursue a growth with equity policy orientation in 1954. Uh, as I discussed in the morning session, growth is still good for the poor. Uh, I understand the Economic development is a long process of economic growth with structural changes. And the sustainable development process, growth and equity, not growth versus equity, consideration is crucially important. Uh, sustainable with a quotation. So uh, uh, most of you here, uh, you think about sustainable means environmentally sustainable. But for me, sustainable means <coughs> We uh, say a Japanese economy, Japanese society has a, a built-in mechanism for long-term economic growth. I use sustainable in this sense. Uh, Japan's aid. Uh, Japan was the top donor for 27 countries in bilateral aid flows in 2010. Among these countries, I found nine Asian countries, India, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Vietnam, Myanmar, Maldives, Mongolia, and Laos. This is just facts. In the past, uh, we, our ODA is a huge amount, 
15 years ago, we, Japan is a top donor among DAC member countries. But right now, uh, our ODA budget is declining, and maybe a fifth or sixth in DAC members. Uh, what is the role of aid? Uh, I think uh, Japanese government expressed a rough idea for uh, post-MDGs. But I think as a general development economist, uh, goals are goals. Uh, for Japanese, in the Japanese society, such kind of UN-based MDGs and some other uh, accepted goals. It's very important for thinking about budget issue. Uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs discussed the uh, Minister of Finance how to increase ODA budget. In this connection, uh, MDGs and some other goals by the UN and some other international organizations is very important, but uh, operationally or economically speaking, it is not so uh, effective. Uh, this is my understanding. Okay? Uh, I understand that uh, economic development should be done by self-help efforts. Uh, developing countries, they should do their own efforts. External assistance uh, is a supporting role for long-term sustainable de economic development. Uh, Japan's aid, what kind should be done by Japanese government. This is my view, uh, promoting a phase shift. Uh, economic development is a process of successive phase shift. Uh, phase from one development phase to another. For example, uh, we, Japanese economy, passed a turning point in the labor market around 1960. Uh, this is maybe a, a starting point of Japan's high growth. Before this turning point era, uh, the ship development phase is quite different. This is my understanding. And uh, Japan's aid should be. I understand the limited role of emergency aid, but I believe promoting phase shift should be a major role of development cooperation. This is my view. Uh, Japan's view on long-term economic development. Uh, many Japanese economists uh, consider the development process of developing countries as qualitatively different dimensions from the neoclassical model. Uh, in developing countries, various markets are considered to be underdeveloped uh, due to significant informational asymmetry and the monopoly and the various in various markets. We should think about uh, development policy based on this understanding. Uh, the principle, uh, I'm afraid this is a very vague. Uh, in the past, we had just two uh, aid principles, humanitarian consideration and the recognition of interdependence. Uh, this piles up vagueness of this, the above aid principles. Uh, Japan's aid has been consistently conducted in line with a strong, though implicit, motive. Aid should be conducted to long-term economic development of recipient countries. Uh, we had two ODA charters. This is a Japan's aid philosophy. The first one is start uh, 1992. The ODA Charter was revised in uh, 2003. Uh, how about environmental issues in ODA Charters? In the first ODA Charter, uh, environmental issues are explicitly stated. But in the present, uh, which was revised in uh, 2003, Environmental issues are just mentioned in one of the global issues. Uh, in preparing the revision of ODA Charter, uh, we had various discussions, some disagreement among experts, but anyway, uh, this is a, a present ODA Charter of Japan's aid. I understand that uh, we observe the 
Dynamism means Asian countries. First East Asian countries, then Southeast Asian countries, and shifting to uh, South Asian countries. Uh, how to maintain this dynamism is very important for the world economy. And I understand uh, East and Southeast Asian countries are clever followers. Uh, they utilize the diffusion of dynamism uh, from Japan to Asian so-called needs, needs to Ace ASEAN countries, then ASEAN countries to China. Uh, such kind of uh, followers mechanism is very, very important. Uh, I repeat, uh, the major role of aid is promoting the shift of development phase. And the goals of development are different. It's dependent on the development phase. A constraint for phase shift are different for individual countries. For poor countries, a poverty reduction is the most important goals. I believe growth is good for the poor. Uh, say there are many papers, say Dara, Krimberg, and Cly, this year's World Bank working paper. Uh, geographical distribution of Japan's aid. We first uh, gave aid to East and Southeast Asian countries, but right now shifting to poor countries all over the world. Uh, aid money should be used effectively and efficiently. So uh, growth promoting aid will be a mainstream of Japan's future aid. Uh, Millennium Development Goals. I understand that. I think you have some disagreements, but most of the target goals have been met. Global poverty reduction has been achieved by the sustained economic growth. Uh, this understanding is the basis for thinking policies of future development cooperation. Uh, the last slide, this uh, quoted the Bhagwati Panagaria's book. Uh, they presented two tracks for the strategy of future reforms. Track one, reforms aimed at accelerating the sustained growth while making it even more inclusive. Uh, track two, uh, reforms to make redistributed programs more effective at their weightiness. I think Japan's aid should be focused the track one approach. Uh, this is my understanding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kohoma. Um, Professor Kohoma, as you can see, that he has presented the rationale for promoting growth. Um, in, in the post-2015 development agenda. He also argues that competitive market environment and appropriate development policy, these are the two um, necessary factors to capture the full benefit of aid. And um, we have seen from <clears throat> his presentation that he gave um, some useful insights about Japanese, uh, Japanese development um, aid uh, particularly to the East Asian uh, countries, and towards the end, we see he mentioned that he, the um, Japan's aid now is shifting from the East Asian and Southeast Asian countries to the poorer countries all over the world. And uh, finally, he also made that uh, Japan's development strategy and um, and the aid policy. Um, is focused, should be focused towards the inclusiveness, um, inclusive growth. Um, so we have now um, come to the end of the session, not end, end of the session, we have, be, we have uh, heard all the presentations. And the presentations actually focused a wide range of issues, uh, starting from the uh, from the presentation of uh, Puja, where she talks about you know, uh, inclusiveness, uh, social justice, governance issues, and then we heard about the sustainable development goals, sustainability um, issues, and also the importance of climate change, and finally, um, the aid policies and development strategy of one of the leading economies uh, in the world. So now, no designated discussions for this session, but uh, everyone will be discussing. So there is, uh, which is more challenging actually, um, but we have limited time. The, I will open the floor now. Please um, 
be precise and focused um, on your comments or if you have any um, you know um, questions um, you will be uh, you are requested to focus on the issues which have been already discussed but also if you could also focus on issues that like uh, I, I before the presentation I had uh, two issues in my mind I which I will put on the slide uh, that is one is the implications of the changing landscape of development finance for the post uh, 2015 debates and then the second issue is how does post 2015 agenda should be structured and monitored to encourage um, the uh, the providers of uh, development finance to increase their development finance uh, these along with these of course you will discuss the other issues relevant to the presentations so the floor is now open please yes identify and make your point thank you uh, my name is asif Maiman. i'm from stpi in islamabad um, um, first thing i'd like to say um, um, uh, is sir you may be uh, in a minority but you're not alone <laughs> so uh, just uh, but i have uh, i have a couple of questions uh, uh, one is do you think that it is the responsibility, as you said, that you thought Japan's aid philosophy should be based in track one, more towards economic growth. Uh, do you think it, the different types of ways of achieving that economic growth that would result in different kinds of distribution of the gains of that economic growth between the population should be a consideration? Um, certain kinds of growth lead to increases in um, relative poverty and others don't so and should we we I, I don't think there is much agreement much disagreement in the um, economic community economists community about the findings of uh, of dollar and craze paper but should we move beyond defining poverty reduction as just moving people above a dollar 25 a day and towards other measures of poverty as well? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, please, yes. Uh, I think this whole, you know, first of all, compliments to all four in that way. Four different subjects, but I can see that they can be tied up together, and the chair has done that up to your point. Uh, uh, since uh, my first intervention, and it relates to Kohoma-san's presentation, uh, and I take on from where Asif left, is that mm, I think this whole distinct, I mean, this dichotomous framework that some people are pro-growth and some people are anti-growth is very unsophisticated. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, I think literature has moved on. People have uh, done research on this area. We have done particular. And I think uh, Dollar and Craze report, if you go back the earlier one, and the recent ones and others on Kindleberg's. Uh, I think there are others who have refuted that, including the database. I think we have gone through this 10 years back. I think so these are all over in behind us in many ways. So I, I don't want to get, get back to the debates of the 1990s and 2010. If you end up by saying or uh, referring to Arvind Panagaria and Jagdish Bhagwati, then obviously you have made a position. And that's good that it is a very explicit position. I think there's a two-track approach which has been said is an oversimplified approach. Because it all starts when you try to implement that two-track approach. Because it is the choice of instruments, the sequencing of the instruments, and the pace of the instruments, those are applied, those are important. You talk to Mr. Bhagwati and Mr. Panagaria, you will say the only instrument they will all go on recommending, that it is all about further liberalization, further privatization, further deregulation, and accordingly, you will come to the optimal solution and etc. Jagdish Bhagwati and Panagaria even do not believe any preferential arrangements either in trade or investment or any other public regulations, if you go to that. That is even not a Japanese model. You see, you have just what, if you de decipher what Panagaria and Jagdish Bhagwati say, that is a total challenge to the Japanese experience, to the East Asian experience, Korea in particular, and in that way. Those who have in distorted the market in order to create the industrialization boom. And not only the distorted market, only through prices of their domestic prices, but of the external prices to the exchange rate and et cetera. We all know the history. So I find it a bit confusing, Professor, the way you ended up in some way is anathema to the Japanese experience and East Asian experience to start with. The second point I just wanted to make, a relationship between what you have said 
and the MDG experience. I think the connection between Japanese ODA and the MDG relates to one of the most critical missing area of the MDGs, that is productive capacity building. I think Japanese aid has been always linked with the investment prospect. One may consider it good, one may consider it bad. But when we see Japanese aid is moving to Africa, since sometimes competing with China and elsewhere. So you will see that there is a linkage, implicit linkage, between capacity building, whether it is infrastructure, whether it is industrial, industrialization in some way, whether it is productivity growth in agriculture, that was there. So I see in the future, in the post-2015 framework, Japanese bilateral aid as an important ingredient in the development finance toolbox for building productive capacity. I think that is an extreme important advantage of the Japanese aid. Thank you. Professor, since there are two May questions. May I quick yes. uh, response? Uh, uh, his point and his first point is uh, the substantially the same. I understand uh, uh, I think uh, development is a balance between efficiency enhancement and equity issue. This is my understanding. So substantially, I'm afraid we have the, maybe the, almost the same goals because without efficiency or productivity enhancement, it is very difficult to make poverty reduction. This is my understanding. So uh, I think uh, that's why I, I don't have enough time. So if I have one hour, I will discuss Japanese model. What is Japanese model you understand? I discuss with you, but as I mentioned, the Japan's uh, economic policy philosophy, uh, which was uh, announced in 1954. But in your presentation yesterday, uh, you discussed uh, uh, Kuznets in about you, right? You, not you, I, I'm not sure. Anyway, someone make presentation of the uh, Kuznets uh, income distribution, uh, the in about you hypothesis. But this is just a hypothesis, not a solemn, not an established one. Uh, for Japan and East Asian, some East Asian countries, this is just a hypothesis. Uh, promoting income, promoting economic growth, and with maintaining the equity. This is a very narrow path, but we should pursue this. This is my understanding, okay? And your second point uh, and uh, first point, uh, uh, I have no time to discuss Japanese model, but uh, you mentioned the productivity. No, production capacity building is very important. And you understand infrastructure development is also important, okay? So I'm saying uh, Japan's aid competitive advantage, I'm thinking, okay? Uh, I, aid role, role of aid is just limited as compared to total development efforts in the, uh, recipient countries. That's why we should think about uh, their uh, development strategy and if we have some advantage, say, uh, hard infrastructure investment by ODA loans, so uh, we will uh, provide such kind of uh, Japan's ODA. This is just my uh, thinking. So that is yes, sure, sure. So no substantial disagreement, <laughs> okay? Okay, quick response. Sorry. Okay, thank you for being uh, so precise and quick. Any other? Yes. I have a Very question to Pooja, actually. In your paper, you actually describe um, a lot more about what you mean about just governance and also the, the roles of different stakeholders in making this happen. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Because this session is supposed to be about ownership and delivery mechanisms. So my request to actually all the the discussions is about what are the different delivery mechanisms we can use. Same issue with uh, climate change. What are the types of delivery uh, mechanisms that we can say that these are some ways where we can take these issues forward. Private sector, he has proposed one method where you say we involve a, a goal about CSR and have CSR in a more policy format. Okay, but the, my question is really to everyone. What are the delivery mechanisms, different types of owners and ownerships that people should take. Um, so, uh, I mean, the fundamental place on which this whole movement away from good governance to just governance is 
based on the justice framework and good governance necessarily i mean it's not that it's bad it but it just assessed the quality of governance and uh, to an extent got uh, misconstrued to being seen as efficiency or uh, i mean limiting to just that so in that uh, with that as the background it was felt that i mean the abhiyan and then the network uh, uh, various other groups also concur and it's uh, felt that it's important to look not just at, at governance as enabling in terms of just providing the framework, but also that the institutions, the capacities, and the resources that are necessary to, you know, uh, have the governance systems in place that uh, needs to be uh, first uh, strengthened, and the capacities when uh, these three things, when we look at institutions, we, we are referring to the kind of uh, systems that need to be in place to begin with. So if we are trying to uh, critique and say that the govern, uh, you know, governments perform much worse as opposed to, say, a private school or government school, we are talking about a, a poorly uh, resourced, ill-equipped, uh, you know, uh, ill, uh, I mean, poorly funded contract teacher uh, supported sort of government school system. So that is the first thing relating to institutions. When we're talking of capacities, it's about the quality of staff, the kind of concerns relating to uh, uh, what capacities are there in place, and not just limiting to the personnel, but also the overall in terms of uh, what kind of technical support, what kind of uh, overall environment is available for the government to ensure that there is uh, uh, the institutions and processes are in place. And resources, I mean, it's not just, again, limiting to the personnel or the number of people, et cetera, but it is more importantly about public financing. And it is extremely important in that uh, somehow kind of uh, uh, refers to the whole justice frame, because if the government starts withdrawing, which is something that's a uh, uh, I mean, that's a common phenomenon across many of the Asian and, I mean, across the global south. And uh, it's, seen, it's been there since the period of liberalization. But it seems that there is clearly a need to kind of address that. Because if you are looking at the role of state institutions, there clearly is merit. I mean, we have uh, evidence from OECD countries to substantiate that. So uh, these three, inst I mean, these three kind of form the basis around which we are talking about just governance. And uh, as I had mentioned, there are some five uh, broad areas within which we have tried to articulate some kind of delivery mechanisms. I mean, looked at what kind of mechanisms can we actually be uh, looking at. And these are might not be really new or something that hasn't been discussed earlier. But uh, we believe it's important to just put it out and say that these are the essential must-haves that we are uh, asking for. So the first relates to transparent governance processes and mechanisms kind of promote more uh, participation of people. So when we're talking of that, we heard a lot about the right to information uh, as a tool. So that is clearly something that's very important and something that we see is a, a handy sort of to ensure this, to kind of keep this uh, uh, on track. The, uh, there are some other ways in which this can be looked at. So the government budgets, there are civil society actors who have collaborated at least in India and in many other countries as well, Bangladesh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure Nepal and uh, several other countries, Pakistan, there, there's a lot of independent budget analysis and budget tracking happening. So in that, there is also a merit to kind of look at the, you know, uh, pro, you know systems such as budget statements that could be in place, that could be uh, advocated for as a way to ensure there is greater transparency of what kind of policies are going to be presented and how can the uh, citizens actually engage? How can they know what the priorities are and what kind of concerns can they look at? And then, of course, the data-related uh, concern, which, was, which has been uh, spoken of a lot. So freely available, easily accessible, information on budgets, on financial policies needs to be there and needs to be kind of a, a prerequisite. And then, of course, disaggregation of this database. I mean, database, we do have a lot. But then how disaggregated are we looking at? So we have the socioeconomic caste census. Now, that, that's something that's new that has come up in the Indian governments. Uh, per, you know, they, they're looking at counting the number of uh, economically marginalized, disadvantaged groups, uh, socially disadvantaged groups. So these are all uh, mechanisms and ways in which we could look at. The second, uh, I don't know how much time, but 
So the second thing relates to, I'll just give maybe one more example and then we can uh, leave it at that. But when we are talking of uh, accountable governance systems, again, accountability, transparency, participation are uh, seen as more or less pillars. But within that also, we look at the kind of oversight mechanisms. And like I said, civil society oversight mechanisms, there are many ex examples, particularly from India, such as the social audit that was introduced, then we have the right to information, etc. But then we are also moving beyond that and seeking for formal institutional oversight mechanisms in place. So there is practice of parliamentary oversight, but the implementation aspect is flawed, given that there's not enough capacity within the, uh, I mean, w for parliamentarians, they do not have the kind of secretarial support. I mean, it gets down to those basic sort of concerns. So uh, we are looking at these kind of issues. And then, of course, there are several other things relating to responsiveness, respon uh, relating to inclusive uh, mechanisms and processes, and of course, looking at the overall human rights uh, framework. Thank you, Pooja. Is there any other yeah. questions? Oh, OK. Please. I, uh, you know, just quickly, I just wanted to add to what you said about just governance. If you could also give the example There is a mic in front of you. Just in front of you, this one. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, if you could uh, also um, give example of how um, uh, the decentralization of the government has happened uh, and the Panchayati Raj institutions, and then equal, I mean, the reservation of, for women and the excluded groups in that decentralization um, a bit, Pooja. Thanks. Quickly. So, yeah, uh, we also have this whole uh, Panchayati Raj Institutions Act and with which there has been a lot of decentralization in the country where we see that the three tiers of governance, so the lowest tier has uh, kind of uh, is in place. However, there have been studies done in the previous organization that I was associated with. There were studies where we compared two states. So Rajasthan is one state, Kerala is another state. So we see that there are concerns there as well. So while some states remain at, uh, you know, they have uh, confront with first generation sort of concerns relating to not having enough capacity, not having enough awareness, et cetera, in terms of how to kind of set up the, uh, you know, governance structures at the lowest level, Gram Panchayat uh, facilitation, et cetera. But then we also see there are many examples, many states like Kerala, like some other states, where they have a, a kind of, uh, you know, address these concerns and move beyond. And now they're looking at issues which are much more uh, strategic and much more uh, uh, substantive in how, what kind of planning, I mean, how would the planning process, how could they kind of engage with it much more, you know, on a regular basis and not just in terms of like the annual, um, uh, it, there's this annual work plan and budget that needs to be prepared at the grassroots level and comes up for most of the government schemes and programs. So uh, they are trying to kind of the multi-year budgeting or there are several other such concerns that continue to kind of, I mean, I don't know. Mr. Gopakumar, and then. Um, uh, two uh, uh, questions on uh, uh, this financing on domestic uh, resource mobilization. Well, the taxation is an important issue. People are talking about uh, you know tax justice and uh, to have a more much more progressive uh, taxation policy. Um, I don't know the uh, GDP tax ratio in the region as a whole, but uh, in India, etc., it's it's very low. Like it's uh, uh, around uh, 16, 14, 14 to 16 percent. So it's uh, uh, in a development phase. Actually, it's a, uh, uh, it's very low. Like uh, in many countries, it's in like uh, during 60s and 70s when this development miracle was happening. Tax uh, GDP ratio was so high. Uh, so oh, that's one issue. And second, um, uh, in India, we passed a, uh, even though we did not comply with the law, but we passed a, a act uh, basically restricting the physical deficit, uh, uh, putting a ceiling on uh, physical deficit. Actually, this would be an, another issue uh, because it's done in, uh, with the uh, compulsion from some of the, uh, from the IMF, uh, a lot of policy advocacy, not as a condition, but conditionality, but a lot of advocacy from uh, international financial uh, uh, institutions. But this is also going to tie the hands in a way to uh, find resources uh, 
to implement the uh, uh, MDGs. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Yes, um, this is actually a challenge. Uh, in low-income countries, the tax GDP ratio is about 30 as opposed to 35 percent, more than 35 percent in the OECD countries. So this is, um, in my uh, overview presentation, I had mentioned about the challenges and also it talks about institutional mechanism and um, f institutional framework to be in place. Thank you for your... Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yes, please make your comment. Or a um, couple of comments. First, on, on growth uh, for our colleague professor from Japan. Uh, the question I have is, you know, the diffusion model, which worked very well for East and Southeast Asia, whether that is as applicable today, given what has happened within the WTO framework, uh, whether some of the measures that were available to East and Southeast Asia, whether they're now given the kind of rules-based uh, framework that has been strengthened under the WTO, whether some of those instruments are, are still available. Um, and also the intellectual property, in a sense. Uh, at that time, it was possible to replicate things uh, in a way uh, that it's more difficult today. So that whole kind of diffusion model, whether it's as um, applicable today as it was, say, uh, 10, 20 years ago, um, on the um, changing landscape for um, landscape of development finance, Madam Chair, which you spoke about, um, I don't know whether you've spoken about this before in the last couple of days, but clearly uh, the role of new donors has become very significant. Uh, the DAC share of, of, of bilateral uh, ODA flows has, has reduced. Uh, and the sense one has is that while the conditions attached um, to these flows by new donors is less onerous as far as the beneficiary is concerned in terms of um, conditions related to governance uh, uh, and other, other uh, uh, such uh, uh, measures, um, the quality, there are quality issues. There are transparency issues, there are quality issues. Uh, so really we need to come out somewhere in the middle, <laughs> that the hassle factor of dealing with traditional donors should come down, and we need greater focus on quality and, and transparency from the new donors. Uh, so I, I think that that's perhaps something one needs to feed into the uh, dis uh, di discourse. On delivery mechanisms, again, I don't know if this has come up before, but these biometric ID cards that India is rolling out, uh, I mean, that seems to, certainly sitting across the Park Strait, it seems to offer tremendous potential. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we have a, a national ID card system. Uh, so, you know, in terms of uh, migrating to uh, that, I, I think you've rolled it out to 300 million people already, and it's going to go out to everybody. So, I mean, that, that's the enormous potential, uh, you know, to cutting out the, the, the scope for leakages that this system offers, I, I think it can be really transformative in terms of delivery. Um, the other thing is, of course, conditional cash transfers. Uh, you know, they, they have been very successful uh, in terms of uh, participation in formal education, in terms of immunization. Uh, you know, there is now a very um, rich um, experience around the world. Uh, I, I know that, that people are questioning it uh, uh, a little bit, but I think there's lot that can be uh, learned um, from those countries who've been successful. Um, and finally, um, you know, um, as far as this delivery framework is concerned, and the rights-based approach, we, we, you know, okay, the Right to Information Act is probably at the apex, but then in India you see the Edu Right to Education Act, the uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Act, and now the Food Security Act. Uh, and I think, I think I mentioned this yesterday, the fact that you're seeing um, really improvements in terms of, of the uh, performance or the, 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 life, the life prospects of tribals and non-scheduled castes in a significant way in India now, 
I don't think is, is, is um, not just because of trickle down from growth, but because of some of the, 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 the impacts uh, that are coming through from this uh, rights-based framework that India is putting into place. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for those useful, very useful comments. Um, anyone? Uh, we are, we are, no, we don't have time actually, so. Uh, Karin, I, I, she's I, sitting beside you, so <laughs> she has <laughs> the right to. Okay, the last question or comment. No, I, I, I okay, so, okay, someone uh, from the back, yeah, I would I think. I you, you are speaking in the next session anyway, <laughs> so you can. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, my question is to uh, Pooja. Uh, one of the difficulties that I'm encountering in, in Pakistan when it comes to um, in, ensure that the citizens take place in participation of citizens and access to information. Uh, so one of the problems uh, is a classical example of princ principal agent problems. When you implement these education programs and then you expect that the, they will be accountable to the citizens, uh, for that you need uh, the information to be disclosed and uh, active involvement of the citizens, what happens is that uh, these citizens get co-opted by the public officials. At times, the public officials perform, uh, largely perform in a strict hierarchical manner and they are not accountable to the citizens. Uh, so we lose a lot of public spending there, uh, apart from the fact that uh, the, these funds are, do not really target the, the schools and you know, the, the infrastructure and all that. So this is a very classical problem that we are facing and trying to improve the governance they're talking about just governance so i'm i'm very um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to struggle with this this problem of you know uh, is it about just governance or is it about governance is it about information technology it is about uh, decentralization because all these kind of concepts does point to you know the, you know how to how to improve the state of uh, the societies by looking at for example the state of kerala uh, where is this over 90% literacy rate and uh, where is there's a lot of public debate on uh, budgeting and there's a lot of information. Uh, so, so how do you handle this, this, this complex issue of you know, trying to address this governance problem uh, with respect of, of uh, improving the society's access to information and justice, etc.? cetera? So, um, okay. no, Chair, 30 you, seconds. No, I'm not asking okay. any question. I'm requesting you to ask a question uh, to, uh, I, thought, I thought so. <laughs> I, I was thinking, but then in the interest yeah, of time, I, I would just like to speculate what would be the future of the. No, I would. I have. Agenda yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> I had. I was <laughs> thinking. <laughs> no, no. Um, yes, I have. A, I've, I was thinking to ask you actually. So, you see, there are. Um, if you compare the uh, various reports, the high, starting from the high level panel and the other, you know, com global. Punk compact. Uh, um, there are several targets which actually uh, focus towards environmental sustainability, though not explicitly they to talk about climate change, but they are, you know, towards mitigating or adapting or, um, you know, s or reducing the impact of climate change. Uh, so, uh, I mean, why do you think that climate change should come as a no, do you think, firstly, do you think that climate change should come or appear as a standalone, um, you know, objective or target or goal in the in the uh, post-2015 agenda? Um, or do you think that the way it's being now discussed or the, the targets and goals have been laid out, are they sufficient enough to address the climate change issue? So okay. this is one question, and then after you, Pooja will... Uh, or if, if okay. I'll, I'll give to her, and then you can discuss. You'll have a little bit more time since you haven't <laughs> um, just talked. So if you could very sure. precisely. Yeah. So I mean, uh, to begin with, I mean, the government uh, moved in around early 2004 or so to, um, they moved to, you know, looking from outlays to outcomes, uh, outputs and then outcomes. So the government started thinking of the fact that, I mean, there's a need to kind of not just look at what, how much allocations are being provided, but also to move further beyond that. In the process, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, analysis and research that has been conducted and many organizations, along with many of the UN agencies,
so looked at this problem and uh, i think i completely agree with you it's not something that can be just uh, straight jacketed and said that this is about governance so this is about maybe you know decentra lack of decentralization or greater participation and uh, corruption yes definitely that also comes into the picture but then when we look at just the institutional and the systemic problems and bottlenecks that confront the kind of structures that we we find especially in india the kind of programs and schemes they follow a certain structure so when we kind of demystified that a little bit more we found that some of the concerns were largely uh, systemic and they could be addressed and uh, then of course there are also the bottlenecks and hurdles relating to the budgetary processes and the way it is implemented so maybe uh, i mean doing away with certain uh, procedures and very uh, rigid guidelines might actually lead to greater outcomes instead of having very fixed uh, guidelines which kind of constrain the government officials at the lower levels and do not allow them to maybe spend as much as they could because there are all these constraints that they need to kind of uh, take into account having said that i would also say that i mean it's not that it's uh, uh, an excuse to kind of say that government functions i mean governments do not function so uh, it's something that we need to kind of look at a little bit could you give me a few minutes to respond to his points sorry he raised four points to me uh, can i make response um, did yeah. you Do you, do you, oh, okay. Yeah. The previous speaker. It's okay. Yes. Um, one minute, please. One minute. Yes. <laughs> uh, the first one, diffusion model, is uh, still effective. I think so because how to make rapid catching up? How to utilize important sophisticated technology? How to invite FDI and some others? So this, I'm thinking the uh, late comers' advantage uh, in the sense of Gaussian chrome. But anyway, I have only one minute. And the second one is uh, conditions attached to aid giving. Uh, fortunately for Japan's ODA, we have no explicit conditionality. The third one is uh, rather general response, cash trans, a conditional cash transfer. I think uh, when we think about aid giving, we should think both uh, macro aspect, uh, sector aspect, and the micro aspect. I'm sorry, I can't follow the, your last point. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Yes, uh, Andrew. Okay, th th thank you for the question. Um, briefly, the, to, to me, the, the, there are four potential ways for climate change to feature in the post-2015 framework. Um, the, f the first is, if you like, the, the minimalist and the opt-out, which is that nar climate change is just talked about in, in the sort of overriding narrative. Um, those of you who have read the high-level panel report will actually note that the narrative in there is actually pretty impressive. Um, however, most people just look at the page that has the goals on it uh, and, and don't read the rest. Uh, and the same applies to the Millennium Declaration, which has quite an impressive narrative, but everybody just talks about Millennium Development Goals. Um, however, I don't think climate change in the narrative is, 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 is enough. Um, the second option is for a separate climate change goal. Um, an alternative to that would be a sustainable development goal or an environmental sustainability goal, which has climate change as part of it. And then the fourth option is to have climate change featuring at the level of targets and indicators. I don't think personally a climate change goal has got any political mileage. I think there is scope to have climate change <coughs> built in at the level of targets and, and indicators. Um, but I also think that we need to think about those targets as being expressed differently but consistently with the objectives of the UNFCCC. So we, can, we already have, as the chairs pointed out, a number of targets that have climate change relevance, such as the the suggested targets for, for energy on renewable energy and energy efficiency. There have been one or two suggestions for targets around reduced emissions from agriculture and land use change. Natural resource, Natural resource management, targets about deforestation and so on. Uh, by ensuring that we have some targets along those grounds, which all of which measures towards them would contribute to addressing climate change, uh, we can try and push the climate change agenda. 
What I don't think would work would be to try and introduce targets that are around emission reductions or global temperature changes. That's where the UNFCCC has its territory. In thinking about this, we also need to th think also about the, the, the process. The post-2015 development agenda, hopefully a sustainable development agenda, will be agreed in September 2015. The UNFCCC COP in Paris, about two months later, will be where the next climate change agreement is concluded. There's a, a, a challenge for the UN system to ensure that those two processes don't interfere with each other. One of the ways that they're trying to do that is through the high-level summit, summit of world leaders that Ban Ki-moon has called uh, for late 2014 to try and get some political, if you like, direction to guide the negotiation processes that will follow during 2015, leading up to, to the end of 2015. Um, I, 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 as I say, I, I think that targets is, is definitely a, a, an option. Um, but I also think we need to realize that uh, not all objectives necessarily have to have clearly specified goals and targets ad attached to them. Thank you. Um, I think we should now uh, wrap up the session. I don't uh, you know, have much to say and I don't want to also. Um, I think uh, we have discussed um, an issue on, you know, um, on a diversified level, um, but uh, towards the basic theme that is um, how to improve the ownership for a sustainable post-2015 agenda. Um, so we had uh, very good and able speakers. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and all those who have participated in the discussions and who have joined in uh, this session also. Um, the session is closed now. I, we would break for tea probably. Uh, Karin will have an um, announcement. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Pamela. We will break for tea. Uh, we will come back at f four. <laughs> <four> <laughs> She is in a dilemma. <laughs> she's, she's at in four o'clock. The last session, what we are really going to do is we are going to present from each session um, uh, issues and uh, recommendations for what should go towards um, some ideas for to be considered uh, as southern perspectives into the millennium development um, into the whole discussion. And what we will do is each of the chairs will just summarize. They have pulled out the, some of the points from each session already.